Hello everybody, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. My name is Martin Lovers. I'm Chief Tent Watcher of uh, Supply Chain Movement. Um, I will have a, a nice uh, webinar coming up. We're going to talk about uh, order fulfillment and uh, decision intelligence. So uh, welcome for this webinar. So uh, next to me, uh, you see me uh, on the left, uh, that's me, all right. Um, joining me is uh, Declan Suppel, a client partner of Air Technology. Hi, Declan. Hi, Martin. How are you? Fine. Uh, and uh, also uh, with me uh, joining is uh, Amin. Amin uh, Ben Meshba. Uh, Amin, welcome. Thank you. Hi, hi, Martin. And, and I mean, I really, you know, happy that you pronounced your name, my name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so um, um, this webinar will be recorded. The, the PDF will be made available in uh, 48 hours. Um, all the listeners are on mute, but uh, feel free to uh, ask questions. Uh, I can expect that there's a lot of uh, questions about uh, decision intelligence and cognitive automation. So uh, feel free to ask these questions. Um, and if these questions are uh, in line of the discussion we are having, um, I will ask these questions right away. If not, we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, and if there are still more questions, so uh, we have an also an extra 30 minutes after afterwards. So uh, at five o'clock, uh, we have uh, uh, an extra uh, 30 minutes after talk in the lounge. So we will be sitting at uh, table one. Um, uh, basically, you can join us and uh, there will be kind of Zoom meeting open up. So uh, you can have a direct conversation with Declan and uh, I mean, uh, and myself. All right. So, um, OK. So about era technology so what you see here this is our SM IT subway map uh, the European version it's uh, an overview of all kind of software vendors uh, uh, I have created with my team and published in the supply chain movement the European quarterly so you see all kind of uh, software lines uh, and all the colors have their own uh, specifications so the black one is ERP and you have the red one is warehouse management and of course air technology is also on the map um, and as you can see zooming in um, um, they have a, a subway station on the visibility line and also in on inventory and demand planning and we are updating this and also what we will expect that you know uh, uh, based on the implementations that era will also have uh, a subway station on the digital twin so uh, network design um, Declan, can you recognize the whole SOPE environment and uh, the positioning of ERA? Yeah, good question, Martin. I was just wondering the same thing myself. So um, I, I, I think it's good, um, and I, you know, it's a complicated network, right? Um, yeah. I'm just, I'm just hoping that we don't make you draw a new city and a new network based on what we talk about today or where, or where ERA is going. So the, that might be the case. No, no. What we have seen uh, in the last two years that a lot of uh, digital twins have been implemented, and also some of them based on the technology of Air Technology. So, could you explain a bit about Air and the background before we get into deep uh, about uh, the Air uh, Technology solution? So, what is it? What uh, Air Technology makes different from possibly the other vendors? Yeah, sure. So, so uh, Air basically is a is a platform. And is a platform which is focused on um, on the augmentation and the automation of decisions in the enterprise, Martin. So it's quite a new topic. It's one that I myself only became aware of in the last couple of years. We'll go a little bit more into detail about what that really means afterwards. And Amin will give an explanation of what we really mean by decision intelligence. But it's effectively taking lots of data, lots of complicated data, pushing it through machine learning algorithms and using leveraging the power of AI on our platform to drive and to augment and to drive automated decisions across the company. So, so different than you have like ERP or WMS or TMS, they have standard uh, functionality and a package solution. So uh, our technology is, is providing more like a, a platform for different kind of purposes absolutely yeah and the, and the, the cool thing about it as well is that it you know it comes obviously with pre-packaged let's say standard decisions that we all face you know while running supply chain or running procurement running finance or sales 
but it is quite a, an easy to use what they call low code or no code environment. So it, you know it's easily customizable and, and uh, specific decision processes and decisions can be built on the era platform as well. All right. Um, let's move over to uh, the, the outside world and what's happening in uh, in supply chain. So uh, a lot of disruption uh, have been happening in the last uh, years, I would say. Declan, can, can you give some examples and what does it mean for, in your opinion? Yeah. So, I mean, we're in, I would say, an unprecedented era, basically. You know, we've we've been talking about complexity in, in supply chains, complexity in business. You know, we've seen waves of globalization, waves of uh, low cost country sourcing, um, um, supplier selection and certification around the planet, um, fast uh, consumption, fast, fast moving goods, um, this always on mentality and this expectation, if you like, for immediate fulfillment. And that's been challenging supply chains for years. But if you just take a look back over the last couple of years, we've, we've seen some really extraordinary let's say black swan events you know whether these have been um political disruptions you know big big changes even in europe in the in the political landscape in europe with with for example the the whole brexit um decision in the uk and the impact that that has had on on supply chains um or you look at uh, geopolitical movements and disruptions you know terrorist attacks around the world uh, and hitting us very very close to home as well or ecological um events you know look at australia brazil forest fires that have really disrupted uh, not only our personal lives but also the movement of goods you know and i don't need to go on and but you know there's, there's things like the suez canal blockage recently so we have really been juggling a number of different challenges already over the last couple of years. And if you also, in, uh, on this slide, you know, you, there are also uh, 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 cyber attacks mentioned. So that's also quite new kind of disruption, I, I, I gather. Absolutely. And you can see that as well, you know, as we move towards digitization of our businesses, as we move, uh, you know, over the last 10 years or so, you've seen the emergence of cloud technologies and the, the the readiness and the willingness of, of us all as individuals and corporations to put our data into the cloud um, and that has become a new a new front uh, that we've had to build additional security protocols about and to you know to to figure out how do we manage that right and how do we how do we assess the risk uh, within that whole digital side as well yes and and and, and then uh, the pandemic uh, hit us yeah, I mean, I, and I think that, you know, we, if you just look at some of the bubbles on this chart here, you see, you know, the cost, for example, of um, some of the bigger events and some of the bigger disruptions um, have been ex absolutely extraordinary. Um, but the pandemic um, has put things on a whole new scale, you know. So if you look at, I don't know, the Japan earthquake and tsunami 10 years ago, costing 210 billion or California wildfires, 148 billion, as assessed here by Kearney. The COVID pandemic has caused something in the in the region of three three and a half trillion dollars of income disruption, uh, which you know we're not even out of it yet. Um, no. But this is something that we we just could not have foreseen, right? No, and and and, and we are not out of it, and maybe we are not out of it in the next one or two years because uh, you know there are also uh, you know ripple effects uh, from from the pandemic and yeah. also uh, you know. And, and one of the one of the topics that you know, I think that one of the topics that we've we've we, you know, you put you layer this on top of uh, what we, what we sometimes talk about, which is the future of work. And I think there are more and more conversations going on around this whole future of work topic. You know, what does it really mean now that we've become familiar with working from home, with virtual work environments? People have started to recalibrate what it is that's important. You know, what is it that I expect from my job? What is it that I expect from my um, personal situation. You've got, for example, um, in the logistics industry, uh, people reconsidering what does it mean for me and if I can do this job from home. Uh, so they're less willing to jump into roles, for example, like uh, truck driving roles, right? So you've got a driver shortage overall. You've got, you know, there, there are so many different dimensions and facets to, to these challenges that are hitting us at the moment. Um, yes. And, 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 and one, of the, one of the questions that um, you know we get asked as well as well when is it going to go back to normal and uh, and i think that's probably some of the questions we've heard we've heard this multiple times right so uh you would think well we had the big big disruption early 2020 uh you know the whole world effectively went into standstill 
But if you look at the chart here on the left, you see the, the dark line in the Eurozone, Eurozone or the lighter blue line in the US. The number of the su supply chain disruptions, even though it dropped again in the second half of 2020, is continuing to rise, right? So we're seeing an increase now as operating models are changed, as consumption patterns change, as consumer behaviors change, as we reconsider how to um, run our entire supply situations, that we are still facing uh, bottlenecks. We're still facing uh, longer lead times. And this is actually more than anything on the rise at the moment. So it's not, it's not going away. And I think that we have to recognize that with the whole, with all of these events that we've just talked about, plus with the whole digitization wave, there is a new normal. You know, we're not going to go back to the way that it was three years, five years ago. And and we even uh, we didn't even mention uh, the war in Ukraine because that mm -hmm. is another huge uh, disruptor uh, re disruption uh, now, and uh, it, it also has all kind of effects uh, we haven't seen before. Precisely. Yeah. I mean, and that is. Uh, I mean, I I think most of us have been shocked to see what has been happening there, but also. Yeah. Uh, probably very surprised to see how important the Ukraine is in <clears throat> providing um, basic commodities to the world, right? Um, supplying oil, supplying wheat, supplying grains to the world, um, and this is really going to cause a disruption. One of the one of the more interesting charts that I saw recently, you know, we had heard about the backlog in the LA ports, but um, you know, I, I suppose coupled with the war, but most especially with the pandemic, when you look at the backlog in front of the port of Shanghai at the moment. Uh, that's you know it's a very very big situation we're facing there so that's going to disrupt us probably in the next two to three months as well right? and if you look at the ukraine also that they um um, um uh, are servicing the, the automotive industry to the large uh, part you know and that's also not expected uh, yes yeah absolutely so again uh, you know uh, this is you know another another disruption another another black swan event. Um, so for me, then the question is, well, how have we been dealing with responding to these and how we've we been dealing with managing these, right? Yeah. And, 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 and you know, we have seen a uh, few prices rising and uh, inflation going up. And now we see uh, price elasticity is becoming more and more important. You know, uh, what shall we do with the pri prices and what will, will that mean for our market share and uh, our profit, that kind of stuff that are all kind of new trade-offs happening right now so this is the thing you know and this is you, you mentioned digital twins earlier so you know the, you're finding yourself more and more in a situation where uh, we urgently need to be able to model and predict what are all of these events and what are what is all of this going to have as an impact on my ability to supply or on the demand that i'm seeing in my home in my own company yeah, you know, and uh, it's quite an uh, introduction to my uh, slide about uh, uh, the software uh, investments uh, in supply chain in the next uh, year, I would say. So we did a survey in 2020 among 106 manufacturing companies in Europe. Um, and we asked some supply chain executives about it. And um, basically what you see here is in the blue bars, that's the overall um, uh, respondents uh, uh, answering what kind of software uh, implementation they are going to plan in the next uh, two years. Uh, and the orange one are the more mature companies on the Gartner scale from one to five, on level four or five. And w what's quite interesting to see is that, you know, um, looking at the blue uh, bars, SNOP, sales and operations planning is number one, and next is end-to-end -end supply chain visibility. And that's a broad sense. Um, but if you look at the orange bars, you see some differences. So end-to-end uh, -end supply chain visibility is, is, is uh, number one. But prescriptive analytics is uh, also very uh, uh, big, and it's AI and machine learning. And next, supply chain network design, call it digital twin in that area. And supply chain risk management is also uh, paramount uh, among the investment of uh, the more mature companies. Um, if you look at it, Declan, what is what is your view on the, this this slide on the, the investments? Yeah, I mean, I, I can completely relate to it from a number of different perspectives, right? So, uh, in my previous roles in running supply chain, I have to hold my hand up and say yes. You know, the primary focus for for me at the time and for many of my peers was how do you get how do you get control of your end to end um, supply chain visibility? How do you get control of your sales and operations planning? The cycle and your processes and so on and so a lot of the focus is still and has always been on okay i've got my erp uh, i'm running my sales distribution materials management planning and procurement processes 
but I need to create, if you like, a better alignment up and down the supply chain across these things. So, you know, I'm challenging myself on creating more transparency, visibility, hence the, hence the big rise, I think, anyway, in the last 10 years or so on topics like business intelligence on you know, dashboards, control towers, and so on. But actually, you're right. The leading companies justify or, or confirm my, my own conviction as well, which was if, if we're assuming that um, it is no longer sufficient for us to respond to all of these disruptions and these, this increased volatility, you know, the VUCA world mentality, with the same processes and the same uh, A, B, C, D ways of working that we've been looking at for the last 20 years. But we have to make a step change and a shift into creating a lot more, you know, a lot of people have been talking about agility and so on, but creating exactly that ability to respond to unexpected events and to increased volatility, then you have to shift your view towards well, what, what will the impact be of the next event? You know, what is the impact going to be on my network design? What is the impact going to be in terms of risks and opportunities? And how do I see disruptions before they happen? And how do I prepare my supply chain to react to that? And often, I think that with the um, increased volume of information that is being presented to uh, everybody in the company, whether it's a an order processing agent, somebody in customer service, whether it's a supply chain planner, whether it's a logistics manager, or even the supply chain VP, we get to the point where we just no longer can process this vast amount of data ourselves while dealing with the day-to-day -day trouble that we have and then preparing the next management presentation. You know, quite interesting to see is, you know, supply chain risk management is also a broad range, but I've seen some applications uh, browsing uh, through all kind of news alerts and to see if there is something happening upstream to your tier two, tier three suppliers that might eventually hit your uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. So these kind of uh, applications uh, are, you know, uh, also uh, getting more implemented. So basically you see also new kind of ways to, you know, um, access data, to, to, to crawl for all kind of uh, senses of, 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 of new alerts. So, um, and basically you need a lot of computational power and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, analytics to dissect all this data. Yeah, it's, it's actually challenging the way that we, that we use data and use information, I think, right? So not only is it the volume of information and the processing power and the technology that you need to run it, but it's also, creating, like you said, the link to your, you know, upstream and downstream to your partners along the value chain um, to manage specific events and yeah, to manage specific situations. So you're no longer um, looking at procurement as a finite um, uh, process of sourcing a portfolio of products at a certain cost, but you are needing to move more and more into the situation of breaking that down to individual uh, raw materials or, or or packaging or other materials that you need and looking at the impact that they have all the way down the value chain or up the value chain um, towards your customers and, and your end customers as well. So it's, 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 I think anyway, challenging the way that we, that we will ultimately manage end-to-end uh, -end value chains. And what I also see, and I think that Laura Cecira um, wrote an article about it uh, last week is that, you know, you have ripple effects that, um, there will be shifts in demand you 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 wouldn't expect because you know um because of the the inflation and and, and the fuel prices uh, consumers might uh, uh, have less to, to 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 spend and their behavior will change and all of a sudden also you see a uh, uh, demand shifts to other categories or you know people are spending less on that area and uh, and more on the other area so you also have to look different at the, the, the demand. So the, the, the traditional statistical for, forecast uh, costing ways doesn't, uh, uh, isn't useful anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, and anyway, you look at the typical KPIs that we've been measuring as well, you know, we, we, we would look at forecast accuracy or you would look at something, yeah. you know, around the, you know, is that really sufficient to say, you know, my forecast accuracy has gone from whatever it is, 62% up to 76%. You know, that's not necessarily going to be the metric that's going to tell you that you have everything under control anymore. So if you look at this slide and all these investment, what are all the consequences of these, these digital projects? 
So I think that it's, you know, it's placing a lot of demand as well on our people, right? So um, it is basically saying, not only do you need to um, become familiar with new technologies, not only do you have to um, reconsider what you do day in and day out, but you need to be willing to adapt and you need to be ready for the change that uh, these new ways of working, these new technologies and this vast amount of information is going to be, you know, the, the challenges that's going to be putting on you, on, on you as well. And so this survey here is interesting, I think, because it says, yes, we've, we've managed to improve the, you know, some of the talent uh, that we, we think that we're ready for. But when you look at the question, do you have sufficient talent to deal with supply chain digitization? That most of the respondents here have, have dropped down saying no actually i'm not i'm not happy so even though we've been increasing the level of skill and the let's say training and enablement programs or hiring new new colleagues and new staff we're still chasing the chasing the ball yeah we're still behind the curve and, and why is that you know yeah. i think yeah i mean i think it's probably because um we need to think about how to make a step change in not only, uh, let's say, not only um, having an ever better system for a particular area, a particular point solution. So not, you know, not to move to the latest version of particular, I don't know, planning solution or transport management solution or ERP, but we need to step back for a moment and we need to think about, hang on a second, am I gonna be chasing this curve? And should I not reconsider what I as a human am doing within this complex world and how much of this challenge can I pass on to a, an intelligent machine that's going to model and predict for me. But don't you think that, that a lot of companies and a lot of supply chain professionals now are in a fi firefighting mode and they don't have the time to, uh, to, to, to do a step back and uh, rethink of all this? I agree, but I mean, then you go back to the chart that you showed earlier around, you know, what are the companies that are overall performing better overall are typically the ones that have managed to do just that, right? And so rather than chasing your tail, you do need to, I think, have a, you know, have a, a stop moment and a consider. And that is also part in my experience as well of uh, the, the governance models that we have in supply chain that you, you need to, and it's interesting, there have been a number of different experts around the world, um, who have been preaching this for a number of years saying, you need to plan in your organization to maintain some capacity and some capability with a team that is going to be planning for the unexpected, right? And so you'll have a part of your organization that is running perhaps your uh, most important supply chains or your most important product responses. You'll have a part which is running the more commoditized part of your business, but then you do need always to have a part that is able to uh, distract or, or let's say take themselves away from the day-to-day -day firefighting mode and to stop and think about how do we deal with that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, a lot of companies try to hire uh, a lot of data scientists, but that they are not there, you know, the, the, there's uh, not enough data scientists. So, so you have to develop the data science yourselves. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's an interesting one as well. So I, I for one, I'm not, a, I'm not a data scientist. I don't have a technology background. Um, but I do recognize that we do need to become a little, bit, a little bit more tech savvy in the way that we think and the way that we apply technology. Um, but I wonder if it's the right way for let's say every large enterprise or every large company in the world to build an army of, of data scientists to build what it is that they need. Yeah? And I would question whether or not that's the core competence of those companies or whether or not we're moving into, if you like, a new era of saying, hang on, let's find uh, the right balance between um, having the capability in-house, but not necessarily having to build the whole thing ourselves. So if you look at uh, it from a distance, so what is your view uh, of the, the main challenge? So, I mean, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's still a combination of these three elements here, right? You know, so we're, we're maintaining or we're, we're continuing to see an increasingly complex environment. Uh, it is, you know, this VUCA world is not going away anytime fast. Uh, the current technology investment and the technology that we've been putting in place for the last 20 years, I mean, one of, the, one of my favorite examples is uh, master data management is one of the core issues that I'm still hearing about now, 30 years after the first uh, master data management conversations that I had. Um, and we have people who are increasingly challenged on the one hand, but also 
recalibrating their own desire for the the type of work and the future of work that they see for themselves. So this is a bit of a a bit of a a, a bind that we find ourselves in that we need to break through. Okay, and and and, and um, what what do you imagine then? So 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 this is the this is the era of vision, right? So which is we say, listen, you know, we we are people making the decisions and we use Excel or we use, you know, bar charts and we use uh, spreadsheets to support those decisions. But what happens if we can move from this era into an era where we say, no, hang on a second, why don't we just guide those machines and the machines can do and the intelligence automation can do a lot of the predictive modeling, a lot of the analysis and a lot of the crunching of data that we frankly don't really enjoy very much and we probably don't do particularly well because you've got to remember that we are by our very nature biased. Yeah? There, was a, there was a survey done um, by one of the big uh, research firms recently who found out that more than half of decisions that are taken are taken mainly driven by gut feel, right? And we want to break away from that. We want to be able to deal with stuff very, very quickly and do it in a data-driven manner. So that's the, that's the fundamental vision that we have at Arrow. So and now we get in in, in the, the the era of uh, decision intelligence. So can you explain what the solution is? Yeah, sure. So let me hand over to Amin, who's been uh, at Era for longer than I am, so he's probably better qualified to uh, to answer that question. Okay, Amin. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. Thank you, Martin. So yes, in fact, I mean, we talk about decision intelligence, and I think you mentioned very well the uh, uh, digital twin, right? Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's have also kind of you know just put it in within a category that um, Gartner is talking about, and uh, it's it's one of the top trends or one of the top topics actually in the trends that we have in 2022. And defining it actually to take in fact to the next level the the way we make decisions, uh, as Declan mentioned it a couple of seconds ago, actually talking about decision is related to to gut feeling, but. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, let me explain again uh, the way in simple words as well as that does mean. So it's in fact about digitizing the, uh, the, uh, and augmenting, of course, and automating the decision-making process. Um, it, um, we can also talk about um, the, the fact that it connect, it's, it's a connected platform that is always on, okay? Um, always on, um, it, it thinks, uh, it interprets actually the events using the data. Um, and uh, of course, we're we're looking into the uh, the understanding actually of decision that uh, have been made after 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 the game. Um, and we're talking about a system where um, the decision making and execution uh, would be guided by people. So the topic that we're talking about today, order management, order fulfillment, mm -hmm. where decisions actually can be complex and have to be taken quickly. Um, decision intelligence actually we find it delivers the uh, let's say the agility at the scale, and um, it copes actually with the complexity that we are facing on a daily basis. So, so when we talk about order management, uh, especially when you are in a in a omni-channel environment with web shops, you have we're talking about thousands or even uh, millions of uh, order lines. Um, so, uh, most of the order lines you want to be uh, automated, but uh, how do you want to deal with this? Uh, in an intelligent way, and how do you apply decision intelligence with with a lot of order lines, say uh, for a web shop? Yeah, sure. So the the, the here actually usually the millions of order lines again, uh, we're not diminishing whatsoever the uh, let's say the capacity of of a person of, of a brain, a human brain, of course, to deal with um, a complex situation, right? But uh, what we are seeing more and more is that of course we're going to focus on we, we always do like the uh, you know the the uh, the old, the old, uh, or the still efficient, by the way, yeah? uh, 2080 uh, reasoning, where in fact I would take care actually of the top ones and potentially leave uh, some others actually that are not important. But uh, when in fact we, 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 we don't use the power actually of the machines to help us uh, make the decisions that they should make, it should be making, even a non important, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, scope of or parts of the scope of the business they have. And, and basically, it's it's uh, the first thing, the first element of it is, in fact, being able to cover it, okay? To cover all, let's say, the scope that I have to deal with. Second is, you know, when it comes to the fact that uh, I am a human being, in fact, I'm taking care of uh, uh, this on a daily basis. Sometimes, um, you know, I, I, I would like to spend more time planning, anticipating, and, and potentially uh, not, not you know, looking into Excel files, uh, not looking into, you know, th thousands of lines of reports and finding actually the, the issue from a, 
from a big, um, let's say, a big sack of, of things that they have to look after. So here, uh, the objective here is to bring already a solution. So kind of review or do the same uh, logic or reasoning that you would go for as uh, being, let's say, the best person or the best professional actually dealing with those type of issues um, and digitizing that way uh, of, um, of, of finding solutions. And then, of course, uh, being always on, continuously actually looking after uh, the, the issues is also one of the secrets uh, why, I mean, of course, uh, the world doesn't stop when you go home, when you take care actually of your kids, when you actually just take care of yourself, right? Um, and basically, basically if, I, I, if I feel that a colleague of mine actually is taking care of something on my behalf, uh, and even better than that, it takes care of it at speed, and it brings me to actually to the exceptions only to look after, uh, even better, right? Uh, maybe you can uh, tell a bit more about uh, the ERA uh, solution, and maybe that explains a bit more. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, if, if we had to, in fact, define the, the ERA solution in, a, again, in a simple sentence, right? So it, it is, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, it's a cloud-native platform uh, where, in fact, it helps deliver the agility and the intelligence we require um, uh, as, as big organizations um, to drive the decisions, actually, uh, of course, where the new world of disruption, right? Where we have continuous disruptions. So this is, let's say, from, from a high-level definition, what ERA is. So it has been built for the decision, where the decision actually is the central component. And of course, uh, objective is making it with all the components actually we're trying to build around it uh, as, as, um, as clever as possible using whatever data actually we can grasp and, and use, okay? Yeah, you know, I had a conversation with your, your CEO, Fred, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like um, a supply chain is like an ecosystem with all kind of uh, hubs or nodes where uh, trade-offs and decisions are being made. So, um, and I uh, 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 took uh, the, the explanation of a chessboard or mm -hmm. actually that you have uh, on every node where you have a trade-off where to supply stuff or whatever, what to do, what to make. Uh, with every node, you have a chessboard, so you are playing on 30 or 40 uh, chessboard simultaneously. So, and, and basically, uh, look, just like chess, you know, you have uh, computers uh, and do simulations. So, ARA is is doing all these kind of simulations for all these chessboard where you have to have uh, trade-offs being made. Spot on, spot on. And in fact, you know, what, what do you do when, when you make a decision? Basically, of course, either you use your gut feeling, your, your good experience from the situation that's mm -hmm. done. Uh, but then uh, there's also where you, you drive it through the decision and what do you do? It's actually you go through uh, all the solutions that are possible and you make trade-offs, right? And in fact, to make a trade-off is to compare between options. Uh, as you said, like in chess, chess sports, basically, so you have options, you have actually options in front of you, or which one actually is the, has the highest likelihood to, uh, to, uh, to, to give you the, you know, the expected result. And of course, uh, which one, uh, when I, we talk about likelihood, uh, we talk about actually probabilistic, you know, um, definition of that or probabilistic uh, uh, um, uh, problem, I would say, more than just the computation of, uh, you know, uh, plus minuses, uh, and then having cost computed actually on a, on a simple uh, on a simple Excel or uh, or formula, right? So the combination, in fact, of you leveraging the data, leveraging the automation, the science, and so on, will help to to get uh, to get that um, that reasoning actually right. I think the uh, I think the analogy of the chessboard is a great one, Martin, as well. So you you know you think of the grandmaster. I don't know if you if you you read any of the books by some of those guys, and they talk about the fact that you can predict or you can you can think maybe four or five moves ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know these guys are going around and they're playing like you say 30 36 boards at the same time and i think the analogy is great right so you're you're dealing with a set of uh, decisions or or issues that you're trying to model four or five steps ahead of you but we're no longer in the situation where you can concentrate on just that one game but you're actually running 30 different games at the same time yeah and, and you know um what the, these master chess players are doing they recognize the patterns and they if they come across a board and they say and they recognize what their next move should be then mm -hmm. they will do it uh but sometimes they 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 stall and they uh you know they do a, a defensive uh, move mm -hmm. because they don't recognize uh, the pattern of their component uh and is in, in this situation with the the value chain you know uh your your computer can have suggestions for you 
But if you are, you know, prepared to do that, you know, like Eric can can do also the execution because how oh, that board is fine. Let the computer run it. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, that's uh, you know uh, good to know. And and basically, that's also because this 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 uh, ecosystem with different kind of chess board could be different. Mm -hmm. Also, if you are in the same industry, so like if you are in a fast-moving consumer industry, because all the companies are different, they will rely on different kind of decisions. And, and, and basically, you know, you have to uh, be very careful where to uh, uh, focus on and which, which chess board with all the, the different nodes. And this is where I think as well it becomes clear that, you know, we can no longer really rely on, I don't know, an industry solution and assume that everything is going to fit perfectly into what it, what it was that I was expecting to happen. Right? No. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe you can, can uh, dig deeper a bit in your uh, uh, decision uh, cloud solution. Yep. So the uh, and again coming back to the to the point solutions we're talking about, where in fact one one uh, one size fits all, right? That that that's no longer in fact a uh, uh, let's say uh, something we could go for. And and the way we we tackle it at Era is to have four elements. And by having these four elements, it helps you know it helps actually adapting, right? It helps actually look into solutions where. In fact, I need to tackle a problem. What do I need to tackle it? So the first point, you know, left, uh, bottom left, is the data. And in fact, the, the way that we will be able to simplify how to bring data that we need to make decisions across the enterprise, in fact, um, and not only internal data, obviously, because we need also to understand the, the exogenous events and the whatever actually comes around us in the ecosystem, um, to have it in a coherent and a single system, to have it actually one place, harmonized, in fact, uh, within a data model that everybody in the, in, the, in the company will be able to understand, uh, and looking into the same one um, is, is extremely important. The, of course, uh, it doesn't come only to just bring in the data and that's it, but of course, to make sure that that data is augmented, is in fact made for the purpose of the decision. So start from the decision you would like to take, you'd like to make, right? and roll back to see, in fact, OK, what data do I need to make that decision? So this is the best way, actually, to go to, go to, to grasp and to get the, the important and the necessary information. Um, second point, so the one on the, 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 the top left, is the intelligence. So we're talking about, of course, intelligence is uh, um, becomes like almost like a commodity word uh, where we need to put intelligence uh, everywhere. But in fact, the way that we put intelligence um, in, in the that data driven decision is to make sure that we 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 actually look in um, through uh, the analytics that we can make right so looking into modeling actually the uh, the different data in different shapes um, using machine learning uh, or in fact optimizers right so here the intelligence we bring is the power actually of the technology combined with the the beauty actually of having uh, that technology developed for a purpose where it can solve um, you know, complex equations. It can also help you to visualize data in different shapes um, and in charts of, of all natures, as well as using, for example, the, dra the graph database. I don't know if you heard of that, but yeah, yeah. in fact, GraphDB uh, is a brilliant way to understand actually how my network works. It can be extremely, you know, powerful in, in displaying that, and it's also something that we have on ERA, right? Um, third point, uh, talk about automation. Obviously, the automation is the one on the top right. Where, um, why, and you mentioned that very well, right? The, the, the capability of executing and that, that element, of course, having, let's say, a decision, having a recommendation, having actually like a, um, a, the best solution ever uh, through uh, a trade off on, uh, on a different system is great. But what is even perfect is to have that, let's say, done automatically and being able to execute it on my behalf. Okay. So here we're talking about, in fact, being able to automate that. Decision, uh, decision point, making sure that, in fact, it's done real time, generated actually on the data that I'm looking at now, and obviously, um, you know, helping me to execute that back into the operations and feed that back into uh, wherever I need to, to have it uh, fed back so, so that the execution can follow. Last point is about the engagement, uh, uh, bottom right. And in fact, the engagement is because, again, we are all humans and we're not looking, we're looking to screens, we're overwhelmed with screens. And basically, again, as to simplify it, 
um, make sure that the user experience is uh, is brilliant and in fact has has uh, is simplified as possible uh, and making sure that in fact we're let's say looking to recommendations that helps us to solve problems and not only bringing problems to our view and you know just uh, just uh, uh, you know count on you on you to to to, to do something of course uh, this comes with with its lot of uh, let's say being a glass box uh, come, you know uh, to opposite to the to the black box obviously uh, making sure that it is as clear as possible so that you can make uh, those decisions or automate them uh, with uh, with with all um, with all confidence um, of course I'm not talking about having uh, one of these right because one of these is always possible and we, there are actually platforms and tools that can can do that but uh, we are truly convinced and by our experience through our you know uh, uh, you know journeys with uh, with different organizations uh, large or small uh, four of them are you know crucial important uh, to drive the uh, decision trees we're looking for yeah. You know, talking about engagement, I saw uh, uh, a demonstration by Alessandro De Luca, the uh, CIO of Merck Group. Mm -hmm. uh, that was two years ago, and he was talking to uh, the Era Technology Solution, uh, you know, uh, asking for answers about, uh, you know, uh, inventory levels, that kind of stuff. So he was talking to the application and got answers uh, right, right, right away. Yep, absolutely. So it's it's um, it's actually again, if we simplify it, yes, you can talk to Era, right? Because Era talks to you at one point. If you see it actually on your screen uh, on on a web web browser, um, it's a different type of engagement, different type actually of how I would be able to communicate and interact with uh, with my system. And uh, of course, today in a world that is moving extremely fast, and all of the worlds where you are communicating your 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 different uh, let's say digital assistants, right? Um, uh, we can also talk to the uh, to the era app and ask uh, a question about my business and be able as well uh, when I'm commuting actually to the office or when I'm going actually some somewhere um, to to ask to act on a specific point and have uh, the most important actually elements that I need to look after with my operations uh, to, to to deal with them indeed yeah. Yeah, uh, getting back to to, to uh, your first point about data, I think that there's a lot of confusion about you know uh, with business uh, data business warehouses and uh, data layers and data lakes but but i think it's paramount that a company needs some kind of a data layer to extract the useful data into a, a, a you know, harmonized environment as you explained before you can do the intelligence yeah so the, the the element of the data of course as i said maybe i didn't i didn't emphasize on it actually uh, you know enough but uh, uh, having the data is one thing. Having data that is useful is a different thing and a different challenge. And having it useful means that when I look at it, uh, irrelevant actually where am I, right? When you talk about order fulfillment, order management, for instance, I can I can be the, the logistics guy, I can be the, uh, the customer service guy, I can be the transportation guy. I mean, I, I need to be able to refer back to um, information without having to look and, you know, do lookups and so on into all, all different uh, directions uh, and basically having the information you know built to a certain decision to a certain performance point uh, is extremely important so this is why again we, we call it uh, on era we call it the, the cognitive decision layer in fact where you have a layer where um, as soon as we plug you know or as soon as actually we connect to to source system we'll be able already to compute uh, what how, how the operations are are, are, are doing the performances uh, being assessed and also these let's say we call it the semantic data layer where we have in fact um, the uh, irrelevant actually of the source systems you have tms wms erp different erps as well uh, um, you know external data sources as well if you have to to deal with your uh, um, your uh, your carrier for example that provides you web services to to track your your, your deliveries um, all of that actually will be harmonized on the same layer and will be able actually to follow the statuses Again, as they should be detailed uh, for the whole organization. And in fact, that is a key element to, uh, to take uh, as much as we can from it. Yeah. M maybe you can uh, explain it uh, with the example of order management going through the different steps, and uh, that will explain uh, probably a bit more. Absolutely, yes. So the, the, uh, in, the, in the order management, uh, let's say, the, what, what we have to look after, right, is, as I said, is the life cycle of an order. Uh, that's the first, let's say, um, 
important element that we need to look after. In fact, to understand it, and every organization may come with uh, a different uh, set of steps that we need to follow. Uh, sometimes they're really similar, actually, between the same in the same industry. Sometimes you need to go through an extra mile because the market and the country has to go for. So you need that flexibility in the solution or the build that you need to go for. But definitely, you have to cover it all, right? From the the inception of the order, from the creation of the order, uh, be it open or confirmed, until the delivery to the customer, until I have actually the, the proof of delivery to the customer. So uh, if, if we start actually with the, with the, 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 the bottom element, right? So we need to understand, in fact, what are the performances? Today, um, it, it requires a lot of efforts, right? And it requires, as I said, to connect to my ERP, to understand if I have which order I'm looking after. And then I need to go to the, to the carrier uh, portal to key in actually the, 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 the number that he provided to me, basically, and then look to which, which, uh, uh, which place it is. And in fact, then I could communicate back to my, uh, to my, um, uh, to my customer if I need or, or within, the, within the organization here. So ERA would be enabling actually a faster decision through what? Through, in fact, being able to monitor the performances and feedback that to, to the organization. And one element maybe I didn't mention before, right? So again, usually we're talking about, uh, uh, let's say, a one-way uh, step, a one-way, let's say, uh, journey when we start a uh, process to the end. But what is also important is the, to assess the, you know, the feedback loop, right? The feedback is extremely important and being built around the decision itself uh, learning from what I have done in the past is extremely important. So this is why I'm starting with that piece where, in fact, I'm learning, I'm understanding what happened in, 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 in what is happening right now, where, because, in fact, I'm forward looking. But also, if any decision that I have been making is not the right one or any decision that ERA came with, of course, uh, that, that, can, that can happen is not the right one, I need to understand why it is so that next round I will be able to improve and enhance and cover uh, different aspects. The second layer that I will be talking about is, in fact, the order fulfillment. And in fact, here, what we're talking about is, you know, it, it is actually another space where um, what we are using today might not help us to, you know, to drive efficiency within the process. And it cannot be, you know, sufficient uh, the way we could do it. So within the order fulfillment, we struggle actually to find solutions uh, when once it doesn't go as per plan, right? And again, we're talking about disruption. Uh, I would not say it never goes as per plan, but of course, uh, it sometimes doesn't go actually as per plan if, you, if I am positive in the, in the nowadays world. So if it doesn't go as per plan, what should I do? What sh I, should, I should look for opera, you know, solutions. I should actually find a way to, to, to set to correct, to self-adjust and so on. And basically by finding the, uh, um, you know, the, uh, where, where, which orders have the, the right availability, which ones or which customer I should serve first, and uh, which which are the back orders I need actually to look after, and of course you know the to look after what you know what is the basically what which customer or which six segment of my market actually have a risk on the OTIF. So by doing that and by actually looking back to how can I serve that, how can I actually change my network or my distribution to serve uh, you know that that purpose. Um, is one aspect that we also tackle, and then the last element, the top one, um, is about you know. The, the organization is, of course, uh, living into like an ever-changing world. So we have it, we have hard time to to get a reliable allocation and confirm, in fact, the date. Right, hard time to be confident in the data to give. So here, what we are bringing actually as as value to the to the uh, to the organizations is a suite of capabilities where we automate the decisions on how to check, uh, let's say the uh, the. Uh, um, the, the blocks, basically, the holes as well that we have within the order, for instance, and recommend how to remove them. Second, of course, is to go and find which quantity should I assign to which order, okay? And then, of course, confirm a date or dates, uh, you know, to, to different customers. So all of this process, basically, from once I create the order, an order can be blocked, can hold, we, then we find the quantity for it. We know actually which one has, has, has the right one and uh, which, which one should I actually push. Lastly, which date should I be able to confirm to my customer um, is the key point. And here, all of these actually are also coming through, you know, uh, a confidence score. We could provide actually a confidence score on which we will be able to say, I have 100% chances actually to, to make it. Or in fact, we might be able to make it like uh, at, at a certain level, but, uh, but there is a risk that we'll not be able actually to, to go through it. Right. Um, um, I mean, you have uh, prepared uh, 
a, a short demo uh, yes. to, to, to uh, show uh, how it actually works. Let me see if I can uh, start it. Service manager. Once I have started my day, um, usually what I do is to um, go through the you know first priorities in the morning, um, have some staff meetings, um, look into my emails, understand actually uh, what are the urgent matters I have to look after, uh, what also customers actually that are angry that I need to take care of uh, as, as a first priority. And through that process, I will also have to look into different screens. Actually, once I have found what I need to, to work on um, and um, let's say expand the reports, dashboards, um, I look through and the screens in my different systems to understand actually what I need to deal with. Okay, so when I say that ERA can do that on my behalf, and in fact, uh, by digitizing the process of making decisions in terms of the allocation of in inventory or quantities to uh, different orders slash customers, and about the date, I will be able to commit to my customers. And more than that, being able to dynamically understand and in fact, make sure that I am fulfilling that commitment I have made to my customers. So let me take you through um, ERA orders. So ERA orders has already taken care of the different orders that I am looking after. And on my behalf, there has been already more than 3,000 orders confirmed to customers through different logics that I have, uh, of course, designed. And ERA has brought to my attention seven exceptions. And these exceptions are those that are, in fact, requiring my highest attention. Okay, so let me take you through one example. Um, this first order actually is um, is about making sure that we're able to fulfill the necessary uh, fill rate, but here we're able with this uh, availability of, of uh, quantities in stock and so on, we'll be able to fulfill up to 20%. What we're looking at as well is not only what I am able to fulfill, but also how am I doing it, okay? So by opening the pegging details, I will be able to understand that uh, the quantity I will be able to fulfill is coming all from the uh, quality inspection type of stuff, okay? So once I have done that, I will also be able to potentially look for alternatives. And why should I look for alternatives? What if ERA can suggest me already a different date to the customer, so a delay that is announced of eight days, um, making a, a better fill rate than I had before? So while, in fact, having this specific proposal, I can either confirm the proposal that they have, or in fact, generate a new one. Once I have committed um, the different dates to different orders through this list that has been brought to my attention, I will need then to understand if I will be able to respect the commitments um, given to my customers, right? So in, in that sense, uh, we have another example of a capability that helps dynamically make sure that we are fulfilling the demand as per the commitment they have made. Let's have a look to this first example, where ERA suggests to their chip a specific order from the main source location to the customer location. This will help me to meet the customer requested date, even at a computed extra cost that has been detailed down here. This will help me avoid an amount of penalty that would have been charged by the customer if it would have been late on the first commitment. By confirming this specific recommendation, I will be able then to plan or replan or change my plans actually that I have first come up with once I have confirmed the date to my customer. So again, the objective of this capability is to dynamically suggest new alternatives or other alternatives while I have already a commitment to my customers and being able to still fulfill that commitment. So still in the planning stage, all right? So let me take you to a little bit further actually in the chain, to the execution. I have another capability in the uh, logistics skill set, which will help me monitor the events around the orders that and the commitments I have with my customers. So this capability, looks after each of the orders that I am uh, about to deliver to my customers, close operations, and monitors 
the planned dates for each of the steps compared to the actuals and generates exceptions. So still same concept, I'm um, looking to the exceptions. So whatever has, has to be taken care of autonomously by ERA would have been done. Whatever needs my attention, then I will, need, I will have a look at it. Let's have a look to this recommendation. Where this capability is analyzing each of the steps of the order life cycle from the order creation to the delivery to the customer. And we trying to detect through business rules if we are delayed in this process or not. In this case, we see that the loading slot is different from the planned loading date. And in fact, the ARIS category therefore is being tagged as firefighting. So ARIS is recommending to reach out to the carrier and specifically monitor the um, date of delivery to the customer. Otherwise, we should update the customer with a new ETA. However, what we bring in addition to these business rules that are applied is a machine learning model that is analyzing uh, two years worth of um, shipment history and finding actually patterns where despite the fact that the planned loading date is delayed by the carrier or any other element, we still be able to deliver on time, meaning detecting false positives of delay. And in this case, with the characteristics of the shipment, where some of them are the carrier, for instance, the city from, the city to, the distance, the, uh, um, the date on which uh, we are shipping the goods, and uh, the quantities and the products and so on and so forth, we see that by the past, and in fact, according to the model that we have applied, we have a likelihood of certainly not being delayed. In this case, we also simulate other dates in the future, so that while discussing to the, with the carrier, we'll be able to either accept a new date or in fact see for alternatives in order to keep the date that we're looking to deliver the customer on. So by showing these three capabilities I have just displayed, I was able to first give the possibility and the capability to commit to the customer through the ATP skill, then replan according to the commitment I give, and at the end, make sure that the execution goes as per plan through this last capability in the screen that I'm showing here. Back to you, Ditlan. All right. Okay, um, Declan, um, uh, interesting uh, demo. Um, Declan, can you um, summarize why, why ERA? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, Martin, I mean, the, you, you've heard it from Amin already, and I, I won't go too much into the details, but basically this is, um, it's, a, it's a single platform, right? ERA is a single platform. It's been designed from the bottom up to drive decision intelligence. Um, it's faster because the data crawlers, the cognitive data layer, the skills are ready on the platform. A lot of this is patented technology that has been de developed over several years. Um, it's scalable, so you know you, it's it's a SaaS solution, right? So you you start with uh, the amount of processing power and the sizing that you need for the particular business uh, decisions that you're looking to resolve with ERA, and you can scale it up very very quickly and very easily from there. Um, it's it's frankly it's more economical, I think, as well. So rather than building the whole thing yourself or uh, customizing a let's say an off the shelf solution, um, I think it's probably more economical um, to to uh, to leverage all of the solutions that are available on the platform, and it is constantly being de developed the whole time. So there's a, a very very powerful team of uh, you know product experts and data science experts that are developing this era platform on an ongoing basis. All right, so we're getting to uh, the Q and A now, and we are almost out of time. So um, um, you know, if you want to have further discussion with us. We have a, an extra 30 minutes uh, afterwards uh, in the lounge, mm -hmm. so you have a direct uh, conversation uh, with us uh, in the lounge. But um, um, to, to wrap it up, my final question to you, uh, Declan, is, you know, where should you start with all this? Uh, give us a give us a call, drop us a line. Both Amin and I and many of our colleagues are obviously easily available on LinkedIn. Um, you know, we're very, very happy to run a demo for you, to take some of the data, to upload the data and do a custom demo. 
Um, so you know, there's, it's, it's very quick and easy. So you know, we can we can have a solution up and running around a particular decision within a matter of weeks. So it's quite a quite an easy way to start off with this. You know, your CEO Fred said uh, to me, you know, uh, give us your biggest pain. So wh where's the node where you have the biggest challenge to make decisions? And we started from there. And I completely agree. You know, and this, where's this? What's the stuff? I'm working with a client at the moment who have been tackling a particular issue for six or seven years and they just cannot find a way around it. So they said, listen, can you work on this? And, and we can, you know, and we're doing exactly that. Yes. Yeah, so, so can I imagine, like uh, we discussed before, you have an uh, ecosystem with uh, uh, 30 chess boards. On, on every node, you have a, a chess board. It's, it's the matter of which chess board is the most strategic to you yes. and the most complex where to start. Exactly. That's the one. All right, you know, and that's a good point. Um, well, you know, we're running out of time, so um, uh, like I said, uh, we we're, uh, we will be in the, the lounge uh, right after this. So uh, with this, uh, you know, there is some more information uh, at the website of uh, Air Technology. You see it right here, and uh, you will see it also in the the, the presentation and the PDF. And uh, with this, um, um, I would like to thank you, uh, uh, Declan, for uh, explaining all this. Thank you very much. And I mean, I also uh, would like to thank you for your in-depth uh, explanation. Also, uh, you're a, a, you know, a powerful demo, I would say. Really, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for, for hosting us. And um, for all the listeners, uh, thank you for uh, listening in. And I hope you, you liked it. And um, please join us in the lounge. And uh, if not, I hope to see you uh, at another webinar and uh, in one of the future uh, uh, webinar Wednesdays. Thank you for now. And uh, maybe I'll see you later. If not, I'll see you in another webinar. Thank you. And bye-bye.